If you're looking to outsource the development of a new product or parts of a new product, then in this video, I'm going to show you how to do it correctly so you end up with a good design while minimizing your financial risk. Hi, I'm John Teal. I'm the founder of Predictable Designs, and I'm an electronics engineer and entrepreneur who brought my own product to market. Now I help others succeed with their new electronic products. Okay, let's get started. There are of course many factors to consider when hiring product developers, but ultimately hiring developers comes down to four things. Experience, cost, location, and trust. I've worked with people in the past with horror stories about their attempts to get their product developed. For example, one person I know spent thousands of dollars to get the electronics for his product design. Once he got the prototype, though, he realized that a new design had never even been created. Instead, the engineer had simply taken an existing PCB with similar functions and they put a sticker over the original brand name to make it appear as if it was his custom design. That being said, most developers are good, honest people. However, it is quite common for freelancers especially to overcommit or overpromise what they can do, how fast they can do it, and how much it will cost to do it. The lesson learned is that anytime you hire an unknown developer, regardless of their location or experience, you should always review their work closely. This will drastically reduce the likelihood of having design mistakes, going drastically over budget, or just being taken advantage of because they know you lack the technical knowledge to judge the quality of their work. But wait a minute, you've probably hired someone to develop your product because you don't have the skills to do it yourself. So how are you supposed to review their work? Well, the best solution is to hire two completely independent engineers or developers. One engineer to do the actual design and the other to review the first engineer's work. I've written a lot in the past on my blog about why you should always get independent design reviews. That advice holds true regardless of who you hire, but it becomes more important when hiring an unknown freelance developer. It is essential that you find a developer with experience designing products that are very similar to your own. It doesn't matter if they have 20 years experience designing products if all their experience is designing products that share very little in common with your product. Always remember that engineering is a huge field of study and no engineer will ever be the best in all the different areas. Just as with medicine, engineering is highly specialized. For example, even most electrical engineers know very little about developing a consumer electronic product. This is especially true with engineers fresh out of university. In college, engineers mostly learn how to analyze existing designs, with very little emphasis on developing new designs. Becoming proficient in new product development usually takes several years of actual design work experience. This is why it's essential to hire the developer with the most experience developing designs just like yours. For example, if your product requires custom wireless circuit design, then you definitely want to be sure to hire an engineer with RF design experience or radio frequency design experience. For such a product, it would be silly to hire an engineer with experience only developing kitchen appliances or industrial equipment. The other big variable to consider when outsourcing product development is the location of the developers. When I was a microchip design engineer for Texas Instruments, Probably at least half of the engineers I worked with were from other countries outside of the U.S. And this is because big tech companies know that to hire the best people, you need to expand your search to a global scale. Between Texas Instruments and Predictable Designs, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the brightest people in the world. Many were from the U.S., but many Others were from places like India, China, Russia, the United Kingdom, Germany, Mexico, Malaysia, Canada, and lots of other countries. If you do a search for developers on a freelance website like Upwork.com or Guru.com, then you'll, you'll see the engineers in the U.S. charge anywhere from $50 to $200 per hour. However, if you search for engineers in most other countries, you'll see that the rates are only 
as low as $5 up to maybe $30 an hour. That's a huge difference between you as engineers charging five to 10 times as much per hour. Regardless of their location, just keep in mind, you probably don't wanna hire the absolute cheapest developer. For example, I've known quite a few people who have tried to hire a really cheap developer through a site like Fiverr. I've never once seen that work. And in every single case, it was a total waste of money and time. The same can be said for sites like Upwork, although the quality of developers available on Upwork greatly exceed the quality of those available on Fiverr. You can definitely find some very good developers on Upwork, but the problem is separating them from the bad ones. Reviews alone are not always enough to separate the good developers from the bad ones. Contrary to the thoughts of many entrepreneurs, there is no reason to limit yourself to hiring only local developers. It's much more important to find engineers with the ideal skill sets, regardless of their location. Unless you live in Silicon Valley, you will struggle to find good, good engineers locally. One major downside with hiring someone on the other side of the planet, though, is the time difference. For example, if you're located in the US, and you hire someone in Asia, there will be a huge time difference. But if you're located in Europe or Australia, the time difference with an engineer in Asia will be minimal. If you're in the US, then you could hire lower cost developers in Mexico, Central America, or South America to minimize the time difference. But I found there are usually more choices for developers in Asia. Experience trumps location and convenience every time. A big time difference may make any type of instant communication difficult, especially when working with developers in a time zone close to 12 hours different than your own. In that case, you will find there is very little overlap when both of you are working. You will likely be doing a lot of communicating late at night, but if you have a full-time day job, you may find that this time difference is actually beneficial. I know when I had a normal job while working on my own product on the side, I found it very convenient to be able to communicate at night when it was typically morning time in Asia. Many times you may ask a question but not get a reply until the next day, and this adds extra development time. But remember, something has to give. If you want both good developers and cheap developers, you, you can never have it all. With most development decisions, you, have, you always have three things to consider, quality, cost, and speed. You can, you can only ever get two of these, but never all three. So in this case, you're gonna go for quality and cost, but you're gonna have to give up some of the speed. If you do hire an offshore developer to do the actual design work, then I suggest that you also hire a domestic developer to help guide you and to review their designs before you make any final payments. In fact, this is one major benefit of my Hardware Academy program where you can get lots of low cost second opinions from great developers. Okay, now let's discuss how you should pay your developers. The majority of freelancers charge on an hourly basis but it's in your best interest to pay, on a, to pay a fixed price for the project when possible. Considering that most projects always take longer than forecasted, paying a fixed price will likely save you money. Most importantly, paying a fixed price limits your financial risk. Nothing is more frustrating or stressful than having your product cost twice as much as forecasted, and this happens all of the time. However, usually only more experienced developers which have been doing freelance design work for a long time will agree to a fixed price. Otherwise, they don't have the necessary experience to be able to estimate the project time accurately enough to feel comfortable offering you a fixed price since they take on most of the financial risk if the project is more complicated than they forecasted. The absolute best way for you to set up payment is by paying a fixed price on a milestone basis. Instead of some random payment structure, set up payments based on the completion of specific milestones. For example, for the electronics, you could split up the project into the following nine milestones, which have clearly defined deliverables. Milestone number one could be to create a block diagram of the circuit. Milestone number two could be to select the critical components. Number three, design the schematic circuit diagram. Number four, generate the bill of materials. Milestone number five, design the printed circuit board layout. 
Milestone number six would be to order the actual prototypes for the PCB. Then the next milestone would be to program the firmware if necessary. Then milestone number eight would be testing and debug. And then finally, milestone number nine would be delivering working prototypes to you. But how are you going to know that each of these milestones has actually been completed correctly? The key to using this payment strategy correctly is to be absolutely sure each milestone is correct before making payment and proceeding to the next milestone. Do not rush through this process. To do this correctly, you really need to have another independent developer evaluate the work of your primary developer. Paying on a milestone basis is really the safest and best method of payment for both you and the developer. By breaking up the project into several milestones, it also lowers the risk of non-payment for the freelancer. A milestone payment strategy works whether you pay hourly or fixed price. To lower your risk even further, you may wish to consider the use of what's called an escrow account. And an escrow is an intermediate account for making payment. So at the beginning of each milestone, you would fund the escrow with the agreed upon amount for that milestone. This gives the freelancer the confidence to proceed knowing that the money has already been set aside. Upon completion of the milestone, you release the funds in the escrow account to the freelancer. Although there are standalone escrow services, I typically have used the escrow services offered by the big freelance marketplace websites such as Upwork. Okay, now let's discuss how to interview new potential developers and what questions you should be asking them. Although a freelancer won't be your employee, you should still act like you are hiring a long-term employee. Switching engineers in the middle of a project, although extremely common, will be a major delay for your project. So take the time to ask lots of questions up front. Be sure you hire the best developers that will stick with you in the long term. By asking the right questions, you can also simplify any possible future transition to a new engineer. Okay, let's look at some of the questions you may wish to ask any potential developers. The first question I would ask is what types of products have they developed in the past? As I've already mentioned, like medicine, electrical engineering can be broken down into numerous specializations. It's really important that you select an engineer that has the experience in the exact areas needed for your product. You wouldn't ask your family doctor to do brain surgery, so don't expect all electrical engineers to have the skills necessary to design your product. Another question to ask is, can they do the entire electronics design process? This includes designing the schematic, the PCB layout, prototyping, programming, and testing and debug. Your project will generally flow much smoother if all of the electronics development is done in one place. For example, having the electronics hardware designed in India and then the firmware developed in the U.S. will create lots of unnecessary, unnecessary complications. Another question is to ask is, do they have access to the equipment or people necessary for making modifications to the PCB once it's prototyped? This includes the ability to swap out leadless integrated circuits, which require more than just a simple soldering iron. Another question to ask is, have any of their past designs made it to market or at least to mass manufacturing? Or another good question is, how long have they been in business? And then another good question is, where are they located? That's obviously going to be really important and one of the main criteria that we're looking at for pick, selecting the, the best developer for your project. Many engineers do freelance work temporarily between full-time jobs. So you want to avoid this type of freelancer for anything except the smallest of jobs. You need developers that will be committed to, de to developing your product from start to finish. Another question is how you need to determine, it's not necessarily a question, but something you need to, to determine or ask yourself is how are their language skills? You need to be confident that your engineer can communicate accurately when discussing really technical topics with lots of details. Writing proficiency will be most important since most of your communication will be through email. Okay, now let's differentiate a bit between two broad types of development, which may require different types of developers. There are two broad types of development. You have a proof of concept prototype development 
And then you have the development of the manufacturable prototype or the, the custom design. For electronic products, one of the defining differences between these two prototypes is the design of the custom PCB. A proof of concept prototype uses off the shelf development kits and modules to create a prototype that demonstrates a product's functionality. A proof of concept prototype is much easier and cheaper to create, but unfortunately, it is usually not feasible to bring the, the proof of concept prototype all the way to market. And this is primarily because of the higher cost, but also because the proof of concept prototypes are just usually too large for most commercial products. And this is because development kits and modules are usually much larger than a custom PCB design will be. The type of developer who will help you create a proof of concept prototype will many times be different from a developer that creates a manufacturable version of your product. A PLC prototype is commonly more in the domain of makers and maybe engineering students, whereas a manufacturable prototype is the domain of product design engineers. Just be clear and define up front which type of prototype you need. Now, a, a quick word of caution. Unfortunately, there's a pretty good chance that the engineer you hire to begin your product design won't be the same engineer that finishes the design. As I've already mentioned, one downside to hiring freelance developers is they may all of a sudden not be able to proceed with your project. Perhaps they got a new full-time job and can no longer do freelance work. So you need to plan how to best simplify any transitions required to a new developer. One of the biggest challenges with switching engineers is switching software, especially for the PCB design. There are dozens of software programs available for designing electronics. Unfortunately, few of them are compatible, making it very challenging to change design software software while a product is in active development. It would be nice if there was one dominant software choice, but unfortunately, there's really no Microsoft Word equivalent for electronics design. There are, however, a few programs that have more widespread use. Probably the most common choices are Altium and Eagle. Although there are better other programs that I like a lot better than those two, those are two of the most common ones. So having your design done in one of those two programs will make it much easier to find a new engineer to finish up the design if that becomes necessary in the future. Also, having your engineers formally document their process and decisions can help any new engineers catch up quickly. As a product creator today, you are really fortunate to have access to a global freelance marketplace. You now have access to amazing developers all around the globe. So remember, don't limit yourself to hiring only local developers. One major benefit of having access to, to developers around the globe is that it allows you to drastically reduce your development cost. This is because developers in many countries charge five to 10 times less than developers in westernized countries, especially in the United States. Regardless of who you hire to develop your product, you have to be careful to ensure you hire the right developers and that you don't get ripped off. The best way to accomplish this goal is by also hiring other more experienced developers that you already trust to have provide independent oversight and guidance. Okay, I hope you found this video helpful. I'm John Teal with Predictable Designs and I hope you have an amazing day. Hey there, this is John Teal, founder of Predictable Designs. If you enjoyed this video and you wanna keep learning more about developing, manufacturing, and selling new hardware products, then be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also check out the websites predictabledesigns.com and thehardwareacademy.com.